Um, as Judy said, my name is Joe Banks, so I produce a visual and sonic arts project called Disinformation. Um, I give quite a lot of talks. I think the last one I gave was a few years ago. Uh, I've given about 50 or 60 talks over the years. Um, and this is the first time I'm going to attempt this one. Most of the talks I give are quite kind of factual. Um, and this one's really kind of more like storytelling. So I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes about um, some work that uh, <coughs> relates to the passengers. Uh, exhibition projects um, and then read some extracts from the name of the rose by Alberto Echo for about 10 minutes and then read the short story The Book of Sand by Jorge and Luis Borges which also lasts about 10 minutes so you know it should come in at just under half an hour for the whole performance. Um, the title of the talk is Language as Metatechnology. Language as Metatechnology. <laughs> <laughs> So it kind of makes sense. But you know, the sort of idea is not to kind of prove a point or reach a definite conclusion, but just to kind of chuck out a little of ideas and kind of talk about some fun stuff. So there's, you know, there's no kind of definite end point to all this. It's all a bit discursive, which is like a polite way of saying uh, randomly. In 2018, I was approached by the artist and curator Duke Hill to propose an exhibition for the Sluice HQ art space in Hackney, East London, for the inaugural exhibition of the Passengers Offside series. Um, there are some postcards for the uh, you know, different passengers projects on the desk outside, but these are the ones for the actual show that I don't know if you guys want to take one. Um, uh, for the show that occurred last year. Um, Passengers Offsite evolved from the Passengers series of exhibitions and events, which Judy had programmed between September 2016 and October 2017. Presentation on the premises uh, of Gould Architecture on the first floor of the Brunswick Centre. Um, the iconic modernist, the Brunswick Centre, the iconic modernist housing and retail complex in Bloomsbury, central London. For the Passengers Offsite series, a new venue, uh, called Vision Signs, a now disused former commercial sign making workshop, provided the cue for the focus of this exhibition and the invitation to write this short talk provides a welcome opportunity to describe something of the matrix of ideas that gave rise to this exciting and highly enjoyable exhibition project, um, as well as an opportunity to discourse on related ideas that are suggested to me by the presentation of Julie's Uncertain Ruins exhibition here at Swiss Cottage Central Library. While the field of semiotics is more uh, commonly associated with the American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, it was the philosopher, in fact, by training psychologist and engineer C.W. Morris, who defined semiotics as, quote, the science of signs. In a statement which has definite parallels with the choice of the name disinformation as the brand name of the artist project that I produce, the semiotician and novelist Umberto Eco stated that, quote, Semiotics is in principle the, the discipline studying everything which can be used in order to lie. Provocative as this sounds, Umberto Eco's statement has real form of integrity, since, in keeping with the notion of falsifiability in the philosophy of science, and as the communication theorist Colin Cherry put it, quote, information can be received only where there is doubt. At the time of the exhibition in November 2018, the original signage for Vision Signs, which there should be a picture here. So this is the actual front of the building with the Vision Signs. They are very, very strange piece of sign making because you can hardly read the word Vision at all. And then you've got the word of Signs, massive there. Anyway. So um, Vision Signs remained intact above the entrance to Sluice HQ. So, you know, like it's a disused sign making workshop, and, you know, they haven't come science. And, and part of the appeal of this exhibition opportunity stemmed from memories of childhood visits to commercial sign makers with my father when I was a child. With that in mind, when I think of the word semiotics, I imagine the names of esteemed philosophers such as C.S. Pierce, C.W. Morris and Alberto Eco, written in Biro on the overalls of literal sign makers. I imagine these distinguished intellectuals as the amiable old geezers 
cigarette behind the ear, flicking through the sun on the daily mirror, brewing up in the back offices of factories like Pierce Signs on the New Cross Road in South East London, near where I grew up and near where Dad worked. I've never been that much of a fan of exclusionary notions of so-called high culture. And as the media theorist Marshall McLuhan said, quote, advertising is the folk art of the 20th century. And in terms of the 20th century folk art, these old blokes really were the cutting edge. Especially if we consider communications as a form of engineering, which is you know, basically the sort of central concept of information theory. Um, Semioticians themselves are literally makers of signs, and sign makers, including the old blokes working in the back room, Pierce Signs. Sign makers of all professional stripes are literally semioticians. So it's pretty difficult not to be a semiotician, really, all the episodes open your mouth, but you know, I'm trying to kind of literalize the metaphor, you know, make it clear that all forms of sort of commercial signage and commercial advertising are sort of sort of applying semiotics. With that in mind, uh, it's appropriate that the conceptual centerpiece of the exhibition of this HQ was a literal sign. So this was actually the sort of main exhibit in the show, um, designed by myself and made by Julie, with an economy of means that hints at a much deeper anthropological narrative. That sign consisted of no more than the exhibition title and the name of the artist's project, embedded into and reversed out of what of that most primordial of communicative visual symbols, an arrowhead. You know, you can give a whole talk about the relationship between arrows and signage and kind of uh, tool use and language and things like that. It could be very interesting. Um, <clears throat> from the outset. Uh, the Sluice HQ premises existed one, in what one, what one might call a slightly challenging space. I'm looking at Carl. Uh, the gallery was really hard to find. Uh, with no shop front and only a narrow doorway which opened into a long dark corridor, then opening out into a surprisingly large exhibition space inside. And the experience of trying to find the gallery was all the more confusing because the street address, Morning Lane, uh, sorry, because the street address was given as Morning Lane, was advertised as Morning Lane, while the address printed over the actual door turned out to be Hackney Walk, so they were like two completely different things. So on the publicity it said one thing, and actually when you got there it said something completely different. Like some kind of topographical, I'm over dramatizing this slightly, but you know, you can go with me on this. Like some topographical equivalent of an ambiguous neck and cube illusion, the venue seemed to exist in two different places at the same time. Although there was, of course, much more to the exhibition than just that one sign. In practical terms, the central exhibit doubled up as the actual signage which informed visitors they had not, in fact, arrived in the wrong place. So, um, this book, Rorschach Audio, Art and Illusion for Sound, is a discourse on psychoacoustics, audio semiotics, and sonic art, which was, incidentally, partly written in an office at Goldsmiths College. 100 metres from the site of the old Pierce Science Factory in New Cross, which just occurred to me recently. Extrapolating the same in Aristotle's Poetics, the book states that, quote, the earliest form of sound recording technology was not a machine, you know, not like a tape recorder or a, you know, a kind of wind up 78 RPM gramophone or any of these kind of things. The earliest form of sound recording technology was not a machine, but was written language. The passengers off-site off show also featured a second language as meta-technology exhibit. It wasn't just like asking people to schlep across town to look at one piece of paper. Yeah. Um, it, so there was a second exhibit. In fact, there were seven or eight exhibits, but in terms of this kind of thematic kind of area, it was a second language as meta-technology exhibit. A speech synthesis artwork which explores associations between language and sound. This language as, as meta-technology sound installation is conceived to an extent as a stylistic parody of the film Images of the World and the Inscription of War, a really fantastic film by the artist Harry Farocchi. The sound installation uses cutting-edge commercial voice synthesis technology and long, classically galleristic silences the latter to frame the former's uncannily plausible uh, synthetic articulations, aphoristic statements, all quoted from disinformation projects and research. The speech synthesis installation played on rotation throughout the installation, 
talking to exhibition visitors in a crystal clear, it will be crystal clear if it actually works, in a crystal clear and precisely enunciated female voice with a strong regional accent. Quote, language is mass technology. Language is the technology that contains all others. Quote, quote, the earliest form of sound recording technology was not a machine, but was written language. Quote, language is mass technology. Language is the technology that contains all others. Quote, art is not necessarily science, but science is always art. Quote, all artworks are psychology experiments. Quote, the medium is not a message. Art is not necessarily science, but science is always art. Quote, all literature and poetry are forms of sonic art. Quote, all artworks are psychology experiments. Quote, words themselves are weapons of sound. Quote, the medium is not the message. Speech itself is an art form. Speech itself is an art form. Okay. Um, although the Horshack audio book goes on to explore a number of other subject areas, the initial focus of that book is, you know, slightly paradoxically, but there's a reason for that, is that the focus is on debunking of belief in so called electronic voice phenomena. True believers, so to speak, in so called EVP, believe that it's literally possible to make audio recordings of the voices of actual ghosts, and I give a whole talk about the kind of psychology of this sort of belief system, which I'm not going to give right now, but that's pretty much what the book's about, what language is meant to technology aspect came out as a sort of unintended side effect of that uh, research project. Without going into detail about this surprisingly complex and interesting belief system, and bearing in mind that the earliest form of sound recording technology was written language, one paradox is that a genuinely reliable way to at least partially reproduce the voices of dead people is, of course, to open and read books. If you want to hear the voices of the deceased talking to you personally, then visit a library. Language is the, te is the technology that contains all others, and as the architect in town, Hannah Lothal Vizier said, quote, a house is a machine for living. By extension, <coughs> libraries, are technologies, libraries are the technologies for organising language. The intersection between architecture and language physically manifests in the form of the library. The library is a machine for organising knowledge. As described in the publicity material for June's Uncertain Ruins exhibition, the exterior of Swiss Cottage Library, designed as it was between 1962 and 64 by Sir Basil Spence, is decorated with quite vertical fins made of finely polished concrete with Portland stone aggregate which fan out like the pages of a book to give the impression that when visiting the library, quote, one is entering the interior space of a book. In marked contrast, writing from the imaginary point of view of a 14th century Franciscan monk, William, and a Benedictine novice, Anza, Umberto Eco described in the novel The Name of the Rose, the classificatory technology that allowed the librarians to structure, organize, and physically navigate their store of written knowledge. The older, more rationalist Francisca described how, quote, the library was built by a human mind that thought in mathematical terms, because without mathematics you can't build labyrinths, therefore we must compare the mathematical propositions, we must compare our mathematical propositions with the propositions of the builder, and from this comparison, science can be produced. The younger, more impressionable Benedictine described impressions which do more justice to what one might call the inner space of the library. Quote, for these men devoted to writing, the library was at once a celestial Jerusalem and an underground world on the border between Terra Incognito and Hades. So, 
as regards these more fantastical aspects of the atmosphere of and the adventure of libraries and their architecture and the experience of their architecture. In a moment I'll read four short extracts from the novel Name of the Rose in which Jorge Borjos, or Jorge I suppose, Borjos, the blind chief librarian of the Benedictine Monastery of Monomythi, presides over an architecturally ordered and literal labyrinth of signs, an ecclesiastical library configured as a monstrous and poisonous architectural puzzle box. In the following extracts, the monks, William and Atto, break into Vildir's library and explore by landmark, decoding a quote, a place of forbidden knowledge, guarded by many of the most cunning devices in which quote, knowledge is used to conceal its life into his mind. The library built to confuse, root, and deceptive and universal visual and audio illusions. <coughs> then, to conclude, I'll read the entire of a short story of the Book of Sand by the real poet and blind former chief librarian of Argentina, Jorge Borges, 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 um, same person. The Book of Sand imagines what might happen if a retired libra librarian happened upon a book which at least appeared to have the potential to contain blue knowledge. around a windowless heptagonal room to which the nearby stairway leads. It seemed elementary to me. We're in the east tower. From the outside, each tower shows five windows with five sides. It works. Now let's see where the other two doors in the heptagonal rooms lead. But my master was mistaken, and the builders of the library had been shrewder than we thought. Skip a bit. Holding the lamp in front of me, I ventured into the next room. A giant of threatening dimensions, a swaying and fluttering form came towards me like a ghost. The devil, I cried, and almost dropped the lamp as I wheeled round and took refuge in William's arms. He seized the lamp from my hand, and thrusting me aside, stepped forward with a decisiveness that to me seemed sublime. He also saw something as he stepped back. And then leaned forward and raised his lamp and burst out laughing. Really ingenious. It's a mirror. A mirror? Yes. Yes, my bold warrior. You flung yourself so courageously at a real enemy a short time ago, and now you're frightened by your own image. A mirror that reflected your image, enlarged and distorted. He took me by the hand and led me up to the wall facing the entrance to the room. On a corrugated sheet of glass, now that the light illuminated it more closely, I saw our two images, grotesquely misshapen, shape, changing form and height as we moved closer or step back. You must read the treatise on optics with its use, as the creators of this library certainly did. The best ones are by the Arabs. Al Hazen wrote a treatise, De Aspectibus, in which, with pre precise geometrical demonstrations, he spoke of the power of mirrors, some of which, depending on how their surfaces gauge, can enlarge the tiniest things, while others make images appear upside down or oblique, or show two objects in the place of one or four in the place of two. Still others, like this one, turn a dwarf into a giant, or a giant into a dwarf. I don't think they've got this kind of stuff into the Swiss cottage yet. Have a word with the manager. Um, we headed for the third doorway, which we thought we'd not gone through previously. We saw before us a sequence of three or four rooms, and towards the last we noticed a glow. So I'm actually walking around this building, and that was the kind of sketch that Alberto had produced for um, you know, planning the structure of the library in the book. Um, you know, it's impossible to picture what it's like in a verbal description, but I mean, the fact that it's confusing it gives you an impression of what the experience is supposed to feel like. Um, we saw before us a sequence of three or four rooms, and towards the last we noticed a glow. Someone's there, I exclaimed with a stifled voice. If so, he's already seen our light, he said. Nevertheless, nevertheless, shielding the flame with his hand, we hesitated a moment or two. Or two. The glow continued to flicker slightly, growing stronger and stronger and weaker. Without growing stronger or weaker, perhaps it's only a lamp, William said, set here to convince the monks that the library is inhabited by the souls of the dead. But we must find out. You stay here and keep covering your light. I'll go ahead cautiously. 
Still ashamed of the sorry figure that I'd cut before the mirror, I wanted to redeem myself in William's arms. No, I'll go. You stay here, I'll proceed cautiously. I'm light for this morning, and since I've made sure there's no risk, I'll call you. And so I did, proceeded through the three rooms, sticking close to the walls. I came close to the threshold of the room from which the glow, quite faint, was coming. No one was there. A kind of lamp was set on the table, lighted, and it was smoking and flickering. It was not a lamp like ours, but rather an uncovered sensor, like a kind of uh, incense burner. It had no flame, but a light ash smoldered, burning something. On the table beside the sensor, a brightly coloured book was lying open, and I approached and saw four strips of different colours on the page. Yellow, cinnabar, turquoise and burnt sienna. The beast was there, horrible to see, a great dragon with ten heads dragging after him the stars of the sky with his tail making them fall to earth. And I suddenly saw the dragon multiply and the scales of his hide become a kind of forest of glittering shards that came off the page and took circling around my head. I flung my head back and saw the ceiling of the room bend and press down upon me. I then had something like the hiss of a thousand serpents, but not frightening, almost seductive. And a woman appeared, bathed in light, and put her face to mine, breathing on me. And I thrust her away with outstretched hands, and my hands seemed to touch the books in the case opposite, or to grow out of all proportion. I no longer realised where I was, where the earth was, and where the sky. In the centre of the room, I saw Baron Jones, a character from a book, staring at me with a hateful smile, using lust. I covered my face with my hands, and my hands seemed like claws of toads, slimy and wet. I cried out with relief. There was massive taste in my mouth, and I plunged into, into infinite darkness. I woke again after a time. I thought the century is here and blows pounding on my head. I was stretched out on the floor, and William was slapping me. Come on, Enzo, William said, whispering to me. There's nothing. Everything, I said, still delirious. Over there, a beast. No beast. I found you raving underneath the table with a beautiful Mozarabic apocalypse on it. Open to the page of the Mulia Amicta Sole, the woman of the apocalypse, where the woman was clothed by the sun. Confronting the, the Mulia Amicta Sole, confronting the dragon. But I realised from the door that you'd inhaled some, from the odour that you'd inhaled something dangerous, and I carried you away immediately. My head also ached. You saw nothing. The fact is that some substances capable of inducing visions were burning there. I recognised the smell, perhaps the same that the old man of the mountain gave to his assassins to breathe before sending them off on their missions. So we've explained the mystery of the vision. Someone puts magic herbs there during the night to convince importunate visitors that the library is guarded by diabolical presences. In confusion, as best as I could talk, recall, I told him of my vision and William laughed. For half of it you were developing what you glimpsed in the book, and for the other half you let, you let your desires and your own fears speak out. This is the operation of a certain herbs state act. Herbs, mirrors, this place of forbidden knowledge is guarded by many of the most cunning devices. Knowledge is used to conceal rather than to enlighten. I don't like it. The perverse mind provides a presider of the holy defense of the library. As we roamed, seeking the way, there's the path, escape from the lab labyrinth of the library. As we roamed, seeking the way out, suddenly in the center of the room, I felt an invisible hand scrape my cheek with a groan, not human, not animal, echo, and, and a wild groan, not human, not animal, echoed in both that room and the next, as if the ghost was going from one room to the other. So what this is kind of describing in a way is similar to a number of um, architectural sound installations that have been designed, you know, the, the, the light is actually been used as a kind of sound installation, stretching on the magic side of it. Um, I should have been pre prepared for the library's surprises, but once again I was terrified and went backwards. William must have had an experience similar to mine because he was touched on his cheek and held up the line when we looked around. He raised one hand, examined the flame, which now seemed brighter than moistened the finger and held it in front of him. It's clear, he said, and showed me two points on opposite walls of the man's head. Two narrow slits opened there, and if you put your hand to them, you could feel the cold air coming from the outside. You put your ear to them, you could hear a rustling sound, as, as, it, as of a wind blowing outside. The library must, of course, have a ventilation system, William said, otherwise the atmosphere would be stifling, especially in the summer. 
Moreover, the slits provide the right amount of humidity so the parchments will not dry out. But the cleverness of the founders did not stop them. Placing the slits at certain angles, they made sure that on windy nights the gusts penetrating from these openings would encounter other gusts and swirl inside the sequence of rooms, producing sound, producing the sounds that we've heard, which, along with the mirrors and the herbs, increased the fear of the foolhardy who come in here, as we have, without knowing the place well, and we ourselves, for a moment, full ghosts were breathing on our faces. line is made up of an infinite number of points, the plane of an infinite number of lines, the volume of an infinite number of planes, the hypervolume of an infinite number of volumes. Unquestionably, this is not the best way of beginning my story. To claim that my story is true is now that it's the convention of an infinite made-up story, but my story is true. I live alone in a fourth floor apartment, apartment in Belgrano Street in Buenos Aires. Late one evening, a few months back, I heard a knock on my door. I opened it and a stranger, and a stranger stood there. He was a tall man with nondescript features, or perhaps it was my myopia that made him seem that way. Dressed in grey and carrying a grey suitcase in his hand, he had an unassuming look about him. I saw at once that he was a foreigner. At first, he struck me as old, but only later did I realise that I'd been misled by his thin blonde hair, which was, in a Scandinavian sort of way, almost white. During the course of our conversation, which was not to last for an hour, I found out that he was from the Orbeez. I invited him in, pointing at a chair. He paused a while before speaking. A kind of bloom emanated from him, as it does from me. <laughs> I sell Bibles, he said. Somewhat pedantically, I replied, in this house, we uh, are several English Bibles, including the first, John Wycliffe's Bible. I also have the Cipriano de Valerius, Luther's, which from the two viewpoint is the worst, and a Latin copy of the Vulgate. As you can see, it's not exactly Bibles I stand in Europe. After a few minutes of silence, he said, I don't only sell Bibles. I can show you a holy book that I came across in the outskirts of Bicanar, Rajasthan. It may interest you. He opened the suitcase and laid the book out on the table. It was an octavo volume bound in cloth. There was no doubt that it had passed through many hands, examining it, not surprised by the unusual weight. On the spine were the words of Holy Writ and Lowland Bombay. 19th century probably, I remarked. I don't know, he said, I've never found out. I opened the book at random. The script was strange, was strange. The pages, which were worn and typographically poor, were laid out in double, double columns as in the Bible. The text was closely printed and it was ordered in versicles. In the upper corners of the pages were Arabic numbers. I noticed on the left hand page bore the number, let's say, 40,514, but the right, the facing right hand page, 999. I turned the leaf, it was numbered with eight digits. It also bore a small illustration like the kind used in dictionaries, an anchor drawn with pen and ink as if by a schoolboy's clumsy hand. It was at this point that the stranger said, look at the illustration closely, you will never see it again. I, looked, I noted my place and closed the book. And once I reopened it page by page in vain, I looked for the illustration of the anchor. It seems to be a version of the scripture written in some Indian language, if not, I said to half my dismay. No, he replied. Then, as if confiding a secret, he lowered his voice. I acquired the book in a town on the plane in exchange for a handful of rupees in the Bible. Its owner didn't know how to read. I suspect that he saw the Book of Books as a talisman. He was the lowest caste, the Dalit. Nobody but other untouchables could tread in his shadow without contamination. He told me that this book was called the Book of Sand. It was neither the book nor the sand. At any beginning or any end, the stranger asked me to find the first page. I laid my left hand on the cover and tried to put my thumb on the fly leaf I opened the book. It was useless. Every time I tried, a number of pages came between me and the cover of my thumb. It was as if the pages kept growing out of the book. Now find the last page, she said. Again, I failed. In a voice that was not mine, I barely managed to stand. This can't be. Still speaking in a low voice, the stranger said, It can't be, but it is. The number of pages in this book is no more or less than infinite. None is the first page, none is the last. I don't 
don't know why they're numbered in this arbitrary way. Perhaps to suggest that the term is an infinite series of minimum. Then, as if he was thinking on that, he said, if space is infinite, we may be at any point in space. If time is infinite, we may be at any point in time. The speculation is irritating me. You're religious, no doubt, I asked him. I'm Presbyterian, but my conscience is clear. I'm reasonably sure I'm not an intuitive man when I gave him the word of God in exchange for this devilish book. I assured him that he had nothing to reproach himself for, and I asked if he was just passing through this part of the world. He replied that he planned to return to his country in a few days, and it was then that I learned that he was a Scot from the Orkney Islands. I told him I had a personal, great personal affection for Scotland through my love of seeds and cue. You mean seeds and Robbie Burns, he corrected. That's what he said about but I don't get that joke, but anyway, I don't know enough about Scottish literature. Um, while we spoke, I kept exploring the infinite book. With feigned indifference, I asked, do you intend to offer this curiosity to the British Museum? No, I'm offering it to you, he said, and stipulated a rather high price for the book. I answered in all truthfulness that such a sum was out of my reach, and I began thinking. After a minute or two, I came up with a scheme. I proposed a swap, I said, you got this book for a handful of rupees with a copy of the Bible. I'll offer you, any, I'll offer you the amount of my pension check, which I've just collected my black letter Whitecliffe Bible, which I inherited from my ancestors. Black letter Whitecliffe, you know it. So I went to the bedroom, I bought in the money and the book, he turned the leaves and started the title page with the fervor of a true bibliophile. It's a deal, he said. It amazed me that he didn't hang on. Only later was I to realize that he had entered my house with the express intention to sell the book. Without counting the money, he put it away. We talked about India, about Orkney, about the Norwegian girls that once ruled it. It was night when the man left. I've not seen him again, and really I know his name. I thought of keeping the Book of Sand in the place uh, left on the shelf by the Wycliffe, but at the end, in the end, I decided to hide it behind a broken set of volumes of the tales of a thousand and one nights. I went to bed and didn't sleep. At three or four in the morning, I turned on the light. I got down the impossible book and leafed through its pages. On one of them I saw the braid of mask. The upper, the upper corner of the page carried a number which I no longer recall, elevated to the ninth power. I showed no one my treasure. To the luck of owning it was added the fear of having it stolen, and the misgiving that it might not truly be infinite. These twin preoccupations intensified my misanthropy. I only had a few friends left. I stopped seeing them. The prisoner of the book, I almost never went out. After studying its frayed spine and covers with magnifying glass, I rejected the possibility of a contrivance. The small illustrations I verified came 2,000 pages apart. I set about listing them alphabetically in a notebook, which I was not long in filling up. Never once was an illustration repeated. At night, in the meagre intervals of my insomnia granted, I dreamed of the book. Summer came and went, and I realized that the book was monstrous. What good did it do me to think that I, who looked upon the volume without my eyes, who held it in my hands, was any less monstrous? I felt that the book was a nightmarish object, an obscene thing that affronted and tainted reality itself. I thought of fire, but I feared that the burning of an infinite book might likewise prove infinite and suffocate the planet with smoke. Somewhere I recalled reading the best place to hide a leaf is in the forest. Before retirement, I worked on Mexico Street at the Argentine National Library, which contains 900,000 volumes. I knew that to the right of the entrance, a curved staircase leads down into the basement where books and maps and periodicals are kept. So one day I went there, and slipping past a member of staff and trying not to notice at what height or distance from the door, 